All right, guys, it's Tuesday night. It is seven o'clock central. And you know what that is. It's time for another conversations with Commodores. We've had so many awesome Commodores come out of the Huntsville area, including our guest tonight, Marvin Thomas, J.O. Johnson product in the 80s. Marvin, thank you for joining us tonight, bud. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Hey, thank you for having me. My pleasure. For folks who hadn't caught up with you in a while, where do you call home? Tell us a little bit about your family. Tell us a little bit about your, your, your career. Well, um, I guess one year after I graduated, this is an interesting story. One year after I graduated, uh, I moved to LA. And uh, I don't, there is, in fact, there is a uh, old friend of mine, Lavoisier Fisher that played for UT. So we actually went out to a wedding for um, one of the UT players uh, in LA, he played for the Raiders. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, the person that was hosting the um, the bachelor party was um, Marcus Allen. So, so I'm out in LA for one week, um, you know, just sightseeing and everything. I was working for an engineering firm in Nashville at the time. I went back to work, gave them two weeks notice and moved out to LA. And I spent, after graduation, I spent my entire adult life in California. And uh, now I'm living in Florida. So I moved to Melbourne, Florida about uh, five, six years ago. Wow. Uh, I'm married, I have two kids. So being out in LA, you know, I kind of Got up one day and, you know, working with my my two boys, one was in the sixth grade and the other was in the seventh grade. Mm -hmm. And I realized that time was flying by and I needed to slow it down. Mm -hmm. So I put in, so I work, I'm in the defense industry. I work with Northrop Grumman uh, out in LA. I worked in the, in the space and satellite uh, uh, area of defense. Mm -hmm. uh, moved to Melbourne, slowed it down a little bit. Um, you know, did some high school coaching for my kids, getting them ready. Uh, and uh, so now they are, once a freshman in college, going uh, to uh, Emory-Riddle uh, Engineering, and the others, uh, sophomore in North Carolina, playing lacrosse. So awesome. that, that, that's how we ended, in, ended up in Florida. Louis Woolridge wants to know, or says, you don't call him anymore. <laughs> Well, Louis, he moved across the country. <laughs> yeah, when we're in LA, Louis, you know, I could, I could uh, tag up with you. Yeah. So. Wow, that's awesome. You go out to LA and you get hooked like that. That's cool. Well, you, you, you know, the funny thing that I discovered um, uh, about myself was that, uh, you know, graduated from Vandy, you know, it afforded you to, you know, to, to find work easily. But I think the problem was for me, it was just, location where you know where do I want to be in life I went out to LA and, and it was everything that I enjoy you know fitness weather you know technology and, and everything and so it was like a no-brainer for me I mean never never thought about going to California went out there and, and just went holy cow now and, uh, the real question is did you continue your rugby career once you got out to California uh, believe it or not, uh, I, I did play uh, um, probably for about two years when I was in California. Wow. So there were, uh, there were a, co a couple of other friends that were out there uh, that I played with, and uh, we, we kind of kept going a little bit. For those of you who don't know, in addition to playing football at Vanderbilt, Marvin played a little rugby at Vanderbilt as well. And Marvin, Billy Smith, one of the Keystone Cops, says to tell you hello. Hey, Billy, how are you doing? And Rob Chura, one of my teammates a few years after you, kicker out of St. Louis area. Rob's watching us tonight. So thank you, Rob, who's been on the show. Actually, Billy's been on the show, and I'm still waiting to get Lewis on the show, but that's okay. We'll, we'll get to him soon. Marvin, how did you get out of a powerhouse high school program in J.O. Johnson up to Nashville, up to Vanderbilt? Why not one of the other schools? What got you there? Uh, another interesting story. So um, when I was in high school, I played nose guard, like kind of like a, a middle linebacker. 
Mm-hmm. And um, so my coach gave me the option of, st- you know, standing up like a middle linebacker or I was on all fours, like a nose tackle. Uh, so, uh, that went well in high school. So needless to say, I didn't have true linebacker experience. Mm-hmm. And as you know, growing up in Alabama, the, most of the guys are hogs in high school. You know, I played against people like West neighbors and, 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 and the likes, um, I wanted to go to, uh, I actually wanted to go to Auburn and not Alabama. I was a big Auburn fan. Auburn thought I was too small at the time. Wow. So um, I was going to go to uh, I actually, you know, when I was being recruited, I was being re- recruited by a lot of the uh, more the Ivy League, uh, the, the Princeton mm-hmm. and the Browns and things of that nature. Uh, one day there, there was a coach, uh, I think it was coach, uh, I don't think it was coach McCorkle, but he was visiting my high school looking at another individual named Marvin, a guy named Marvin Ford. He just happened to have saw me in the weight room training. Mm -hmm. And uh, so my, he came, he watched film on, on this teammate of mine and he went to my high school coach said, who is that kid? And started watching film on me. You know, about an hour later, my high school coach came, you know, who just left my office? And I'm like, no, you know, oblivious. And, um, he said uh, that was the coach from Vanderbilt and he saw you training and he j- watched film on you. He wants you to come up to, to visit. And believe it or not, I was the last signee of, of uh, Vanderbilt that year. And really, and people don't know this, I, I think the I, I think I ended up getting the scholarship based off Doc Crease. So here I am, this little country boy from Huntsville, and Doc had me in the weight room in dress shoes and a button down shirt doing power cleans. And he said he tested me just to see, you know, if I had the mentality to do it. Yeah. And after that, I, you know, trained in him. He had a talk with coach Mack and they gave me a scholarship on the spot. Wow. And so that, that was, an, I, I, it was just, they weren't looking for me. I was just one of those last finds that, that they, that they found. Well, you know, Marvin, sometimes those are the best stories because how many times do we hear where a coach is coming to a campus or looking on film at one player and they spot somebody else, whether it's in the weight room or on film or watching you work out, doesn't matter how we get there. It's just the fact that we got there. Now, sadly, we lost Doc Crease this past month, and I know he had such an impact, such a powerful impact on so many collegiate players before Vanderbilt, after Vanderbilt, et cetera. And he truly will be missed. Um, But that's incredible that he had you working out or testing you wearing your civilian clothes uh, in the weight room. That's pretty cool. Now- It was amazing. Now you were the class of 82. So you came in in the fall of 82. Who were some of the signees from your class? So it was myself, uh, Kermit Syke, of course, who was my roommate. Mm-hmm. Um, Henry Beeland came in. Uh, from, from Alabama, there was uh, Craig, uh, was it uh, Craig in, uh, God, I forgot their name. There's like six or seven of us from, from there's two from Birmingham from the, uh, um, what is that, Mount Brook area? Well, there's Mount Brook. Came in. Oh, so, Ted, there was, um, were you the same class with Ward Drennan? With, yes, Ward. Okay, maybe Ward Ted Brennan. McCullough? Ted, Ted McCullough. Yeah. Yeah. Those uh, guys. What about, now, Everett Crawford has been on the show, another awesome Huntsville product. Was he your year or a different year? Uh, Everett came after me. I actually re- helped recruit Everett. So uh, Everett, and believe it or not, so, and Carl came before me, Carl Jordan. Yeah. So Carl and I went to high school. All of us three, we actually grew up together playing ball at, football at the Y together. So uh, Everett was younger than me, and he's, he's, been a, uh, he's been a childhood friend of mine since forever. Well, the state of Alabama has produced a lot of Commodores over the years, and the city of Huntsville certainly has as well. Uh, Derek Gregg, several years later, was a teammate of mine, and we all know Dr. Gregg is 
is now the AD at Northwestern. He was with the NCAA, he's with University of Tulsa and some other schools, but another Huntsville, proud Huntsville product. Yes. Marvin, talk a little bit about the transition from a football standpoint of powerhouse Alabama high school. But now you're going to the big boys, you're in the SEC. What, talk a little bit about that transition for you personally, because I know you redshirted. Correct. How was so, that? Bro? Uh, so coming out of Hunchful, it was um, it was it was hard to redshirt. I, I, I didn't, you know, uh, of course, Alabama. I mean, we, we just breed, bleed and breed football. So physically, I was ready to play. Mentally, you know, learning linebacker, I was nowhere near ready to accomplish that, nor was I ready for, for Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt academically. So the redshirt year was, was fantastic. But after, after my freshman year and I got my feet up under me, every, everything went smoothly. I mean, I, I absolutely loved playing SEC football. It, it, bar none, the absolute best. Well, the two photos that you shared and I have subsequently shared to the group, I think epitomize that experience. One, you're making an awesome tackle against Auburn. And the other, you're on the sidelines and somebody must have said something great. And you're with these teammates and you can just see all of you guys, whatever that moment was, that was an awesome moment for you and, and the team. That, that, was, uh, that shot was, the, uh, was us beating Alabama at their homecoming. So it's myself, Armando Fitz, and Everett Crawford. So we're kind of on the sideline. Well, I was in the stands as a high school sophomore, a longtime Alabama fan growing up. I was not happy that day. But little did I know that two years later, a year and a half later, all these guys would end up being my teammates um, for the black and gold and not for the crimson and white. But that's a very memorable day, that's for sure. And I've had... Kurt Page has been on, Chuck Scott has been on and told their stories. Edie has been, uh, so many people who were there that day and had some part of the game uh, have told their stories, including uh, Norman Jordan, among others. But, oh, yeah. Oh, and, Norman's, a, Norman's a great guy. Actually, Norman was uh, one of those seniors that I looked up to, can really kind of, you know, as, as a freshman coming in, you know, the funny thing about uh, – when I was a freshman coming in, so we had like Mad Dog and and um, Big Rob playing offensive line. So I'm on the scout team, and you know you, you always want to give a hundred percent. The linebackers coaches are telling you to go in there and do X, Y, and Z, and then yeah. those seniors, as big as they were, they're like, "Hey, hey, slow your roll there." I mean, these these are guys. These are guys that literally had four plates on both sides of the. Yeah. of the uh, bench when they were bench president. I mean, one of the most intimidating days was one day I, I, I did a blitz at practice through Mad Dog's hole. He, he basically caught me midair and just kind of tossed me back. And I was like, holy crap. I mean, that's how strong this guy was. I mean, he tossed, I mean, my feet were off the ground. He literally tossed me back. So well, between him and Will Wolford and all of those guys who were on the line during that time period. I mean, that was a man-sized line. And for they them to pick you up and move you to places where they need you to be, that's, that speaks, speaks volumes about your growth as well because you're learning from some of the best in the conference right there in, in practice. Who, were, who was on the depth chart ahead of you when you came in as a freshman? Uh, so the, the guys that were ahead of me with, uh, Bob O'Connor, uh, Steve McCoy, uh, mm -hmm. Jeff Cartwright, and, uh, let's see who else there was Bob, Steve McCoy and Cartwright and Rob, Rob Monaco was there, mm -hmm. um, Rob's little brother. So those were the, the guys that were really ahead of me. And then my sophomore year, it was myself, Armando Fitz. Uh, Steve McCoy so we were kind of rotating in yeah and when did uh, when what year was Chris Gaines when did Chris come in Chris Gaines came came in uh, I want to say 
two years. Maybe 80, 84, I think. Yeah, 84. So he had been two years, and I was two years behind him, so that makes sense. I want to welcome Ed Parrish, who's watching us. Thank you, Ed. Ed also was on the show a while back and had such a great conversation with him. Marvin, let's talk about the academics, because we all know that Vanderbilt sets the bar very high in the conference, and particularly during our time period in the 80s, it was probably as business as usual when it came from academics versus ac athletics. There wasn't a lot of sympathy, if you will, out of the administration. There wasn't a lot of support. And if you didn't make your grades, you don't get on the field. So if you're an engineer, that's no joke in and of itself, just as a regular student. How, and you mentioned that the redshirt year was so important. How did you grow up? How did you mature? How did you adapt, if you will, to college well, life academically? Uh, you, you know, I'll, I'll tell you what, it was, um, it was a learning experience. I had to learn how to study for college. And that was the biggest challenge. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, my freshman year, I actually started out as a computer science major. And back in those days, we had to go to the computer lab yeah. to, to do our homework assignments. So I remember my freshman year, my first day of uh, practice, I didn't get on the computer lab until like 12 o'clock, one o'clock in the morning. Wow. And, um, and I think, you know, going back and forth, you know, have, you, you plug stuff in and you run it. And then you go back to your dorm and you make the correction. I remember being late for practice by 10 minutes. Coach looked at me and he said, you're going to have to make some changes. So I switched from computer science that week into engineering. Uh, wow. The one thing that was most impressive about uh, Vanderbilt was that the school or the athletic department, they gave you every and any resources you need to be successful. That was one thing I've always been very proud of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that they did. So I had to, like I said, I had to learn how to study all over again. I got my tutors. My freshman year, I remember I was on academic probation. I think I had a 1.93. Mm -hmm. and, and actually, one of the things that I learned was that I did not know how to study. So I went to summer school. And that was the best thing that could have happened to me because what they did, you know, of course, you know, they're cramming so much into such a short period of time that I had to learn how to study. I ended up going to summer school, doing extremely well. And it was through summer school that I actually learned how to study at that speed. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, I got ahead of the game and, uh, and that became a blessing. You know, so went to summer school, got ahead. I also learned how to take a little bit easier load during uh, during the regular season. Uh, now I'm, you know, of course I'm playing and I'm traveling. So, uh, you know, at the minimum I had 15 hours as opposed to taking, you know, 17. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, and, and I got ahead. So I had a double major, you know, because I was fifth year, I ended up with, a, with basically a double major in uh, computer science and management of technology. So... Very good. Well, guys, I'm talking with Marvin Thomas, originally out of Huntsville, now from South Florida. And we're in the mid 80s. Dwayne Jones says, Marvelous Marvin. Mr. Jones, how are you doing? One, one, one of the great ones there. Yeah, Dwayne is, if, if you can't remember a name, a score, a play, a player, Dwayne has got our back. He usually just, he's got a steel trap when it comes to the history of Vanderbilt football. We so appreciate him being here most every week. Uh, I'm, I'm waiting for well, Coach I'll tell you what, uh, if, 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 if no one has told him, we all appreciate it, Dwayne. So that, that is for sure. Well, he was a great buffer between us and Kelly, that's for sure. He and Luke. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, well, Marvin, when you weren't in the computer lab or doing engineering or football, where were some places around campus, on campus, that you like to just get away with, whether it's with other ball players or maybe you had friends who were not in sports, but did you have any favorite hangouts back in the day? Uh, I did not start hanging out really until my junior or senior year. Mm -hmm. um, I was just, I was way too busy. But um, 
I think once I did start going out, I think the places we went to was Southwinds. Uh, and then there was one other club down uh, downtown, but uh, Southwind and, and campus. I mean, for me, that, that was it. I, I tr tried to um, keep myself out of trouble. Um, the, the, one, the one time that I did uh, get in trouble, Mr. Daryl Holt had to come bail me out of jail. So it, okay, it wasn't anything bad. It you've opened the door. Huh? The statute of limitations is long gone. You've opened the door. Why did Daryl have to come get you? Well, believe it or not, I was coming from downtown. It was, we, had, we had a football game that night. Mm -hmm. um, so I was tired. And I wasn't a big drinker at, the, at that time. So I may have had a half a beer. And I, we were downtown uh, Third Street, First Street. And I remember I cut through the I didn't have my lights on when I left. And because it was so lit up down there. Yeah. So when I cut through the alley and I noticed my lights were off, turned them on, made it on to Second Street, mm -hmm. sirens going. And um, so the guy, the policeman pulled me over and uh, he asked me where was I coming from? And I explained, hey, you know, I had a football game tonight and I was just out hanging out with some guy. Did you have anything to drink, sir? I said, I had about a half a beer. And he said, well, you know, of course, you know, we're tired. I was tired. And he asked me to blow into a test into one of the tubes. Yeah. And I asked him, I said, well, how does this work? I said, does it take the breath off the, the alcohol level off my breath right at the surface? He said, yeah. I said, I'm not blowing into that. I said, this thing would tell me that I'm drunk if I burp. And uh, so he took me in, uh, of course. And uh Luckily that, uh, you know, everything got dismissed. Sure. But, that, sure. but not knowing it at the time, that was the smartest thing to do is to not blow into the, in the tube. Yep. So, and so you I know, got back, released. Marvin, back in the day in the 80s, downtown wasn't anything like it's now. It was Nothing kind of at all. rough. It, part of downtown was rough. I mean, it really was. Absolutely. Wasn't. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, did you... Over the years, you said you, you had hosted Everett on his recruiting visit. Did you, did you host others uh, with any regularity? Did you guys have any particular uh, places that you went? I know there's, they take them to the restaurant. And they do fun stuff on campus. There's usually parties in the dorms. But <clears throat> I know that they try to pair you up with somebody either from your proximity. I know you and Everett grew up together playing ball. Or sometimes they may want to find somebody who's in your position group, something like that. So typically, did you host others on different uh, years? Uh, Wally from Georgia. Did you really? Uh, man? Well, you know, it, it's funny. One of the, see, here's the thing. So during that during that period, Armando Fitz and I became kind of like the ringleaders of, of hosting. <laughs> and uh, and I'm sure everyone knows our, Armando, Mr. Socialite. But yeah. Yeah. we, <laughs> you know, and, and I can say this now. So we started hosting the football parties. So we kind of we're the ones that kind of started out having the the football frat parties. Mm -hmm. And we would, uh, of course, you know, we had money to take the kids out to have fun and everything. So we would um, back then we would pull the money, we'd collect money. So, you know, so much money went out, so much money went towards having the, the big party. Yeah. Uh, and of course, you know, we had our DJs on, you know, Boo and, and whoever else were spinning yeah. records, everything. We would host the parties in the, um, I think in the lounge, like in, in Carmichael Towers. Oh, yeah. And I, I tell you, those were some of the best parties. I, I do believe we got a lot of recruits based off of having those parties. So, well, you know, uh, for a while, they were affectionately known as steroid parties. And a lot of exactly times, right. because of during the recruiting season, would overlap with basketball season. And back then with Barry Booker and Goheen and Drought and all those, and Will Purdue, we had some really good teams. So typically, it'd be after a great win. I remember uh -huh. we, we beat Indiana when they were number one or number two in the country with Steve Alford. We beat Shaquille O'Neal. I say we, the Vanderbilt basketball team did. And you never knew where Barry Goheen was going to throw one in from against Georgia, Louisville, you name it. So you're right. Those parties 
became the place to be for the athletes. And it wasn't just football players. That's there correct. Just about, I mean, it was athletes or no athletes, Jeff Mays used to be a DJ. I mean, there was a whole list yeah. of those guys. But you're right. How many people, Marvin, how many people could you get in one of those lounges right off the elevators? Probably supposed to hold maybe 10 people. There oh had my God. It, 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 it was it was packed. I remember the I remember the one year, I mean, <laughs> it was jam-packed. There were people dancing on the on the AC units and everything else, and we had to flood, you know, oh, yeah. it, it busted, uh-huh. had to flood. So yeah. Brock William calls us into the office and reprimands us. And but uh, you know we had the uh, the trash can and we called it hoochie hoochie juice. That's right. Because uh, <laughs> and the reason we called it that because by the time you've had two cups, it's like who 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 are you? Hoochie hoochie. <laughs> Everyone was stuttering. Uh-huh. And, and you know so it was you know it. I think about it and I told my kids about this and I and I think about it, I said, holy cow, I will be a parent worst nightmare. Here I am, you know, this this guy serving my young high school yeah. daughter or son mm-hmm. this 190 proof punch. Could you but, imagine uh, if a match would have been struck anywhere near that thing? <laughs> oh my goodness. But you know what? You never taste you never tasted the alcohol. And it was just a bit. You know, yeah. I think one of the success, we, we provided, that's where all the funds went. We, you know, we had the free DJ, you know, and we provided the drinks and it was, a, you know what, it was a safe environment. We considered it safe because no one was leaving campus. That's and what that was one of the say, Marvin. Of all you had to do is walk upstairs to your room. And it, it was, it was in the mid eighties. It was music. It was getting out the energy. It was having, letting loose. And you're right. You weren't in the car. You weren't driving around town. You weren't spending money. And you knew 90% of the people in that room. Absolutely. In my experience is they were almost all Vanderbilt athletes or students. Mm-hmm. Occasionally guys would come over from whether it was Fisk or TSU, wherever, you know, other athletes who guys knew. Right. So you least knew them. They didn't just show up. It wasn't a turf war. Or right. Anything. They had to they had to have known someone, an athlete. Yeah. But you're right. Those, those. <laughs> And I don't know if those things still go on anywhere anymore, because that was the mid '80s, not today's time. Today's time, there's pictures everywhere, and people are getting in trouble and all of that. But it was such a carefree time, I guess I would, I would say. So yeah, I, I, I like to say that we had a lot of, um, we had a lot of fun. I think we had a lot of love connections. A lot of, uh, a lot of the uh, recruits coming in probably fell in love. You know. Mm-hmm. Met, met their future girlfriend. <laughs> how how could how could you not in, enjoy that time? But Marvin, let's let's take it on the field of competition. Let's go back to practices. Let's go back to your first game action in the fall of of eighty three. You're used to playing in front of good sized crowds in Huntsville in high school. That may be a few thousand, maybe ten thousand. I don't know. Now you're playing in front of 50, 60, 70, 80,000 SEC weekends all around the SEC. Did the crowds register with you? Did the size of the stadiums, any of that register, or were you able to kind of focus in on the task at hand that day? Uh, the, <laughs> yes and yes and no. So, you, you know, back then, you know, we, we kind of, if you, if you talk about, the going to Florida, going, you know, they're, they're throwing oranges at you. I mean, they were pretty rough back then, throwing oranges at you. You go to Tennessee, you know, I remember there were Jack Daniel bottles being thrown. Oh, yeah. Or batteries you. or that, oh, whatever yeah. else they could throw. Because you had to wear your helmet. They were wicked. We had to wear our helmets going off into the, the clubhouse. A- absolutely. So, uh, but once you're on the field, it, it, it didn't matter. I mean, mo- everyone was so focused on the game and, and, and more intense. I mean, it kind of, you know, if it was a hostile environment, I, I would have to say most athletes loved it anyways, because, uh, you know, we're, we were young, invincible and strong, you know, regardless of who we were playing, every, everyone thought that they were better than that guy in front of them. So Marvin, Joel Walker out of Texas, He's, I think, a year behind me. He said those Vanderbilt parties, he went on his recruiting visit, and that was a big part of his 
his coming to Vanderbilt, that's for sure. And I also want to welcome Flavia Smith. So thank you guys. Marvin, back back then, before the snap, you're getting the defense, I guess, called in from the sideline or however you guys signaled it in, et cetera. Did you guys huddle up or were you just kind of near your position? You looked over and then you kind of got no, into we, the we we huddled up back in the day. So it, it was the it was a huddle. The 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 um, middle linebacker had the call. It was either Steve McCoy and then when uh, Gaines uh, became a starter, he was he was making the calls at middle linebacker. Talk to us a little bit about from the time you break that huddle and before the balls actually snapped. When you're in the stands, or even if you're on the sidelines and you play offense and you don't know your world. Talk to us about the communication that goes on between the interior seven or maybe even the whole 11 pre-snap, post-huddle, come into the line, pre-snap. Well, you know, typically depending on the on the team, you know, if there was, uh, depending on the situation, we're either watching for a, a, either a trick play or you're looking for your men. I mean, during the week, you, you, you know, you got your scouting reports and you know who's going to do what. Yeah. So you kind of look, the first thing is you're looking for the strength call. So, so that you can get up, get on the right side. Then depending on if it's man or zone, uh, you want to, it's that first read. I mean, that, that's what, you know, most linebackers are looking for that first read. Is it going to be a pass or if it's going to be run, if it's going to be double team and you want to make sure you get to your assignment and, you know, do not create the, the open lanes, uh, for, for people to drive trucks through. So, but after that, after the ball is snapped, it's, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make this play. And, and you know, pre-snap, it's so much of it is with your eyes. You're looking at the alignments like you just described, tendencies that you've studied the week of, those kind of things. Is there, back in your time, was there a lot of communication though between you and the interior linemen, the other linebackers? talking, I mean, pointing, saying those kind of things, or was there really not that because you knew your assignments and everybody just had knew what they were supposed to be? Uh, no, there was communication. Like I said, the biggest, the, for the linebackers and the down linemen, like I said, the biggest thing was getting the strength call so that you would know what gap, what responsibility you had. And uh, if that uh, strength call shifted, that's what you want to look for so that either, you know you're going to either step down or step wide. You know, I played all three linebackers position, and then my last year I played uh, rush in. Mm -hmm. So I had a pretty good, uh, pretty, pretty good grasp of that and understanding. Uh, so there's always communication. Uh, once, you got, once you knew your assignment, your lane, mm -hmm. it was just beating the guy there. And, and getting up field and, and looking for where is the ball. And as a fifth year player, you go through your rest year, year, it's a big growth year, mature wise, physically, mentally, spiritually, everything academically. But by the time you get to the end of the process, by the time you're your fifth year, and you, you can see what your academic career, how it's gonna unfold, and you're ultimately gonna graduate with two degrees or the two majors, but when you go onto the field as a senior, it's a fifth year senior, aren't you kind of, this is a bad term, but you're not in cruise control, but you know what you're doing. You figured out Vanderbilt, so to speak. I'm not right. saying that it's easy. It's just coming from that experience. So my, my question is by the time you're a senior, fall of 87, I think, yes. 86, 87, what was that like being now a 22 year old or so fifth year guy? You're not a wide eyed 18 year old freshman anymore. You become a man, so to speak. Right. In that world. What was that? Did you, do you remember that time? Oh yeah. I remember my senior year was supposed to be, I mean, it, it was supposed to have been a breakout year, but I was, uh, I had a lot of injuries my senior year. So, um, uh, I ended up, uh, uh, DeMont Winston ended up uh, starting 
And at that point, I understood the role, I understood the system. So my job then was to help him as, as, as much as I could. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I would have loved to have continue, you know, at, at, at that starting position, but I didn't. Uh, you know, I started in other areas and, um, you know, it, that's the way it ended up. And, you know, I still enjoyed myself. Well, I was going to say, Marvin, you really became a coach. You were a player yeah. coach. That was my freshman year, fall of 86. DeMond was in the same class as me. And he was one of the early, uh, the, some of the freshmen our year who got to play early. And I remember the two of you, you guys playing similar position. Um, but I always, I knew DeMond just from the dorms and who he was and, and that. But you being a fifth year guy and been in the system, you're so much older. I mean, you literally are. And so much more in the program as a freshman, it's hard to step up there. And I know DeMond did a nice job of it. And he ended right. up playing on the next level. But that's an interesting contrast for a fifth year senior and a freshman competing and then working together. Coach Gary Shepard says to tell you hello. Hey, Coach, how are you doing? Thank you, Coach. I, again, Linda must have let him out early from the steak restaurant <laughs> for a bit. Maybe his KP duties are, are over for the night. Guys, I'm talking with Marvin Thomas, of course. We're back in the mid-80s. Marvin's out of J.O. Johnson in Huntsville, now living down in South Florida. I want to talk a little bit, Marvin, about lessons learned in college, because we all learn them along the way. You learn them in junior high, you learn them in college, you learn them or high school, then you learn them as you go. But what did playing sports do for you? What did it teach you? And have you been able to share some of that uh, with your, your two sons who are athletes? Yeah. I, I, you know what, I'll, I'll tell you something. I was, um, I, I think I was a quick student because even when I was a freshman, um, you know, some, and I was just thinking some of the other people that came in my year, uh, Carvel Massingale, um, um, what was it, uh, Rockhead from Memphis? I, we just called him Rockhead. He was a linebacker. M McFarlane, McFerrin, oh, was a well linebacker. Um, Dwayne, if you're still on, bud, who are we talking about? Go ahead, Marvin. <laughs> Dwayne, who was Rockhead? Uh, Jeff, Mc, Jeff McFarlane, McFarlane, I believe, yeah. yeah. This kid was, I mean, he was literally a Rockhead. He was like a, a, like a brick mm -hmm. playing middle linebacker. Arnaz Perry, we had some great athletes on, on our team. And one of the things that, but believe it or not, you'll notice that my sophomore year, those guys weren't there. So, uh, so learning from the mistakes that they were made, that they made, I always tried to help some of the other kids that were yeah. coming in, Tony Pierce, a lot of, and mostly the guys that are in engineering, yeah. you know, trying to share with them the things that I learned from a standpoint of studying and, and prepping, because like I said, you know, my freshman year, I was a 1.9. I mean, I was just, I thought I knew it all. And so I helped those guys. But the other thing that I learned, you know, Doc Chris was, uh, like I said, I believe he's the one that got me my scholarship mm -hmm. and he kind of looked after me. I remember going into his office one day, you know, saying, telling him something. And I'm like, uh, oh, but Doc, that's not fair. And he looks at me, and goes, Marvin, life's not fair. Get over it. And, and it was true. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of a lot of things will happen, you know, in football that is not fair, but it just happens. You just have to learn how to deal with it. And sports really mimics life. I mean, it, it got me ready for being an engineer. I mean, I came across bosses that did not like me. So, uh, it, but, you know, you, you just learn that the sun is shining the next day. And so those were some of the things that, uh, you know, the hard times that I got from playing football at Vandy. It just prepared me for the real world. So it does. It, it, it toughens you up in more ways than, than one. It really, Correct. it really does. I want to take a minute or two, if it's okay, for us to talk a little bit about the contrast between Doc Crease and Brad Bates. I, I was not there during Doc's time, but you were one of the athletes who bridged the gap. And I was there during Coach Bates's time, of course. He, he had such, I'm gonna call it unique 
out of the box training methods, but talk a little bit about the two men and contrast them a little bit, compare them. Okay. Now, I love them both. So this is, this is my version of what took place. Mm -hmm. You know, being a guy from the South and playing in the SEC, you know, it's, it's, about, it's about the meathead. It's about the beef. Now, Doc, he, you know, we had the beef and we, and we had the speed. So you, you, can't, you cannot say that we weren't fast under Doc. So, we, you know, we were strong and we were fast. Now, when Coach Bates came in, I would like to say it was more of a CrossFit type of tr regiment training. Um, it was kind of, uh, it, and it was hard to buy in to, to the logic. But for, you know, and when I say that, uh, I say it from a standpoint of maybe some of the linemen and some of the guys that needed some beef, but they, they slimmed down. So whether or not it was good or bad, I don't know. For me, it, it, it was okay because I was, you know, I had no problem growing and the and his type of training gave me more endurance. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I benefited from it. They're just, but they were just totally two different training yeah. styles. And it, it seemed like Coach Bates was maybe a little bit more leaning toward the modern, like you said, CrossFit, where Doc was really more power. Oriented, but two oh two of two of our teammates have just joined us. Greg Smith out of Chicago, Smitty, Smitty, and Tom Fitz out of Ohio. Tom Fitz, oh yeah. That now I have to tell you guys about Tom. Tom, Tom was Tom was one of my uh, when you talk about having fun off off the field. Tom mm -hmm. was one of my summer school buddies. I mean we. You know, after I ended up going to summer school, I started going every year just to get ahead. And Tom was one of those guys that was there. And um, for, for you, for you guys that don't know Tom, he's probably one of the smartest players on the team. I mean, this guy had the biggest brain I think I've ever remembered. Uh, I could ask him a question about something he wasn't even even in my class, and he could give me an answer. So he had, he had some pretty good hands too. That's for sure. Oh yeah, football wise. Oh yeah. 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 That, that molar connection. <laughs> That's right. Marvin, do you follow the current game, college game? Yes. You do? And, and, and the pro game. Do you see any similarity in the college game now from when we played no. in the 80s? None. None. Isn't, it, isn't it amazing how it's evolved? Yeah. I mean, you know, I was I was talking with Everett Crawford before um, before the show, and we were talking about how the safety um, protocol. The you know, I, I I talk to a lot of people now, and I say you start watching. If you're watching the football, you'll see a lot more hand tackling. It looks more like rugby than anything else. When we played, it was just it was full on collisions. I mean. <laughs> I mean, you may as well have just, you know, Everett was talking about how in practice um, it, they kept screwing up a play and they made him, they made them run it like seven times. And every time he had to go against me and I'm like, yeah, I said, knowing me, I said, you're right. It wasn't going to be fair because I knew I was going to like try to lay you out every time. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and we talk about that. It, it was, it was just, Part of it, you know, you know, I, I you know, I, I'm glad it's evolved because as you think about, you know, some of the stuff we did to our body, I mean, holy cow, it, it well, was crazy. Well, the modern, the current athletes, so much bigger, faster, stronger. I don't think that they can, if they, they couldn't hit nearly as much as back then. You can't do two and three a days like you used to. The hours are much controlled. We had you know, 40, 50 hours a week during the but, season. But let, let me correct you on one thing you said. I, I, I believe the correct words you're looking for with the modern athletes are mutant. So they're just, they're just freaks of nature. They, they are, they are. I'll tell you another fine athlete during our time period, Dante Ferguson has just joined us. Dante! Good to see you, Tay. Thank you, bud, for, for tuning in. We've got just a couple more minutes, Marvin. 
Let's talk about your, your sons as athletes for just a minute. You've had the experiences that you had, but there's a fine line in there at some point, and I had this with my daughter who played college lacrosse. You get to a point where you got to be dad. You can't be coach, can't be all, all of those things that you were when they were younger. Absolutely. You've got a son playing lacrosse. You've got another one at Embry-Riddle. Where do you draw the line and I'm the dad or I'm your dad versus let's let the coaches do their thing? Or maybe you still have some of that influence. I, every relationship's different. But us, again, the modern athlete, the current athlete, they didn't grow up in the same experiences that we did. Far from it. Absolutely. Well, you know, <laughs> My older son, so he he wanted to he wanted to play football and he wanted to do everything, and and most of the teammates that knows me knows that I was pretty hardcore when it came to training and in the gym. So uh, I used to prepare my older son. I mean, he was a late bloomer. I said, "Son, you're going to be a late bloomer, and mm -hmm. but you're going to have all the right habits now." Right. Um, I, I my goal was to work with him until his sophomore year and then say, hey, I'm, I'm done, you know, because I, I can't, you know, I, I want to enjoy being with you and enjoy watching you and, and only give you advice when you ask. Yeah. So, but by that time, his sophomore year, he, you know, he made the decision. He was only playing football because he thought I wanted him to. <laughs> so his true love was lacrosse. He switched over to lacrosse. And, you know, even now I just, I give him advice when, when he asks and, uh, you know, but my youngest son, he saw how hard I pushed the older one. He didn't want to do any sports that I knew anything about. So he was a springboard diver and a tennis player. So he was, he didn't want any part of training with me. So, it, and the sad thing about it, this, this kid, he's 18 and he's touching six, seven. So that's how big he is. <laughs> wow. Isn't it, isn't it interesting how your children with the same parents and DNA and all that can be so different uh, personality-wise and interest-wise. But for a former athlete as yourself, and, and for me, it's hard sometimes, my experience, to not be able to give a little advice, even in a sport. I never played lacrosse, but you see things, and, and but the, the immediate response is, you don't know what you're talking about. I'll listen to coach. I learned very quickly where my place was. I was the chauffeur. I was the uh -huh. ATM. I was the, you know, the kitchen. And that was about my place. But, uh, but, you, but you're absolutely right. And neither did, neither did I, you know, with my son with the lacrosse. And I, I would I say, buddy, you know lacrosse. I don't know it. But I do know hustle. So <laughs> I do know hustle and I know effort. That I can teach you and I can work with you on. And, yeah. the, you know, the skill side, that's on you. Well, Marvin, before we get out of here, I want to talk about what it has meant to you to be a Vanderbilt graduate, to be a Vanderbilt football player, to represent the school over all these years. You've been all over the country. You've interacted with people from all different universities and colleges. What has that meant to you? Uh, you know what? I'll, I'll tell you, it was by far the best decision that I made uh, when I went to Vanderbilt. You know, I know my freshman year, I, you know, because I wanted to play, I thought about transferring. You know, I had a friend of mine that said, don't. I mean, as, as a kid, I, did, I didn't really, I did not realize the significance of Vanderbilt. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it took me being an adult to, to, to grasp that understanding and that knowledge of just how special mm -hmm. uh, the school is. And, uh, you know, the teachers not take, necessarily taking it easy on you or giving you your grades. Uh, it, it, it meant a lot. Yeah. I, I, I wish my kids had have gone there, but you know, they did not because uh, it, it truly is a special place to be. Well, Marvin, I, I sure appreciate catching up with you this evening and I really, really have enjoyed our conversation. Well, I appreciate it. And uh, I'm going to give a peace sign out to, to all the doors out there, guys. That's right. And guys, that's why we have these conversations, just catching up with old teammates meeting new Commodores who I didn't know in years past. But one thing is very consistent is you get to tell and learn 
the journeys, the stories, what made the people, what lessons they learned, and why it's important to have gone to Vanderbilt and represent the school ever since. So thank you again, Marvin. Thank you, everybody thank you. who watched us tonight and have been on the show in the past. We're going to keep doing it. You guys anchor down. Have a good night. All right. All right. Peace out, guys.